One was killed inside of a gas station. The other killed after a Halloween party. Hello, true crimers. These are two unsolved Halloween murders. Viewer discretion is advised. Number one, the case of Norton Gregory. So this case takes us way back in the way back machine, all the way to the 1950s, specifically 1957 near Kirkland, Washington. I unfortunately cannot find a photo of the victim in this case. There's actually virtually no photos for this case. That's obviously given how old of a case it is. But back in 1957, Kirkland, Washington was just considered a really quiet place to live, peaceful, serene. There really wasn't a whole lot going on. It was not as developed as it is nowadays. But back in 1952, a man named Norton Gregory, who was married and had six kids, he opened up his own gas station. And the gas station was maybe half a mile away from where he and his family lived. But it was his way of supporting his family, and they did pretty good. There was a lot of mouths to feed, so business needed to be good in order to pay for all of it. I don't really have much information on Norton as a person. There's like, like no obituary for him or anything like that. One of Norton's regular customers was a, a woman named Mrs. O'Farrell. And on Halloween 1957, Mrs. O'Farrell entered the gas station. She was expecting to see Norton. She did, just not in the way anyone would ever think. Norton was lying on the floor of the gas station and he was in a humongous pool of blood. And she could tell that unbelievably, Norton was still breathing. Um, whatever had happened to him, he was motionless, but he was breathing. So she reaches out to the authorities immediately, and they send an ambulance and police over there. And Norton, who they confirmed was still alive, was rushed to the nearest hospital. But unfortunately, he would not survive. And this is because Norton had been shot five times, all in his head. Three of them were at very close range. And it's really unbelievable that he even survived one or two of those shots, let alone five, clinging on to life for at least another 30, 40 minutes. Like I can't even imagine the pain and the agony one would be in in that situation. In terms of the investigation as to who did this, obviously this is way back in 1957. They didn't have CCTV cameras back then. They didn't have any cameras of that, of that nature. They did dust for fingerprints, or like shoe impressions and stuff like that, but this is a relatively busy convenience store slash gas station that sees a lot of traffic. And if you find fingerprints, it doesn't mean anything because of how many people go in and out. When you have murders that happen in, in settings like this, it is really difficult to discern one fingerprint from the next in terms of one belonging to the killer, one not unless the murder weapon was left behind with fingerprints on it or maybe the cash register, but that wasn't the case in this story. The most common and likely theory is that this was some form of botched robbery attempt. That perhaps Norton was somewhere in the back of the store when somebody walked in and noticed that no one was at the register and so tried to steal money when Norton walked in on them and then the guy reacted, or girl, reacted by shooting him. But the thing is, is that there were three shots fired at close range, meaning the killer was right next to him. And sometimes you would look at that and go, that's personal, that's like a, that's overkill. Shooting him five times in his head, that's unnecessary. Like one or two shots would have been it. In terms of if money was missing from the cash register, I'm not 100% sure. Norton also apparently had some gambling issues and he had some gambling debts. And there was a theory that this was possibly someone retaliating from Norton not paying off his debt. However, that has never been corroborated by anyone. They couldn't find anything tangible with that lead. And so really the only true theory here is that this was some type of robbery that went very wrong. But given how personal the shooting was, was it someone that Norton knew and knew well? That's certainly a possibility. Or maybe this burglar walked in while Norton was at the register 
and said, hey, open the cash register, and Norton maybe wasn't complying, and so he lifted the gun and shot him a few times in his head. That could explain why it was done at such close range. What kind of shocked the community at first was that several weeks after the murder happened, his wife, Helen, would reopen the gas station. And she also ended up dating a sheriff's deputy who she later would marry. I think there were people in the community who saw that as being kind of odd or suspicious, like how would she even dream of opening that store so soon? And how could she marry, you know, a sheriff's deputy just after she lost her husband? But you also have to think, especially back then, she had six kids. She needed to survive. She needed her kids to be fed. And so opening the store was a necessity. She had to. Uh, she may not have wanted to, but she needed it. And she eventually fell back in love with somebody else and got married because, again, you need to be able to take care of all these kids. And so I don't really look at it as necessarily a sign of guilt. I just look at it as a sign of, you know, you know I'm a wife who just lost my husband. I, and I have six kids to feed, so I need to do something. In 1958, there was a local teenager who would end up confessing that he killed Norton Gregory. And he told them that the murder weapon I used, the gun, could be found under a particular bridge. So police go to that bridge, they search everywhere, they don't find the gun. They don't find anything. And as they look further into this teenager, they found out that he was actually a patient at Western State Hospital. And he was there and checked in, admitted, on the day and night of the murder. And really, there's been no more updates since then. This case, it just went cold and nobody seems to talk about it. There's really virtually no coverage of this story. Somebody walked in and murdered Norton brutally. I mean, shot him five times. For what? What was the motive? Was it someone he knew? Was it a complete stranger? Was it related to a gambling debt? It's never been solved. It's never been found out. And with this happening in the late 50s, this is now 67 years later. That's if a killer was in their 20s, sure, they could still be alive. If it was a teenager, they could still be alive. But if they were like someone in their 30s, maybe 40s, they're not, they're not, they're dead. But the killer could potentially still be alive, but would definitely be an elderly person at this point. And at this point, most of his direct family members back then are also gone. And so you look at stories like this and it's like, are they really ever going to care because everyone who was a part of his life is all likely gone? I mean, his kids are probably still alive. And so there are some people left there to get some kind of justice. Even if it's just an answer, that would be something nice to have, some form of closure, even if it's a little bit, something. And it's still possible that someone somewhere out there might know the truth. And if you do know the truth, you need to reach out to the Kirkland Police Department and just give them the information you have. The killer is more than likely gone, and true justice may never actually happen, but there is still a slight possibility. But hopefully, the Halloween murder of Norton Gregory will not remain an unsolved mystery forever. Number two, Arpana Janaga. This case did happen much more recently, back in 2008, and this also happened in Washington, in Redmond, Washington. Arpana Janaga at the time of this case was 24 years old. She was a graduate from Rutgers and she was a software engineer. Arpana loved motorcycles, she loved Taekwondo. She actually volunteered at the fire department and also at the local animal shelters. She was someone who was really enthusiastic about life. Uh, she was well loved. She had a huge group of friends, very popular and really no one could say anything bad about her. She was someone who liked to have fun. She liked to party, as do most young people in their 20s. So it was Halloween 2008. Arpana was hosting or co-hosting a Halloween party at their apartment complex. And this was going to be on multiple different levels of the apartment building. There was going to be like kind of the party kind of go anywhere. And by everyone's accounts, it was a, it was a popular little party. There's a lot of people there. She was having a very good time. She seemed to be in great spirits. There wasn't any noticed altercations with her, but the last time anyone can actually recall seeing Arpana was around three o'clock in the morning when she left the party on a lower level and went up to her apartment on the third floor. Her neighbors would later report that they heard muffled 
boning sounds coming from her apartment, but you know, it was Halloween night, there was a party, there was lots of drinking, and they just thought, oh, this was just Arpana having consensual sex with someone. But that was not the case. What the neighbors actually heard was likely Arpana being murdered. It was a few days after the party. Nobody had heard or seen from Arpana since the party. Her dad became really worried when he couldn't reach her and no one in the family could reach her. The friends couldn't reach her. So one of her friends and then a neighbor at the apartment building would end up going to her apartment to check on her. When they got to her apartment, they know the door was closed, but they noticed that there was some kind of damage to it that someone, it looked like someone had forced that door open. When they walked in, they found Arpana on the floor of her bedroom and she was dead. Arpana was beaten savagely. This was an extreme beating. She had a gag shoved down her throat and she had duct tape around her mouth. So the coroner eventually will determine that her cause of death was blunt force trauma, strangulation, and also she had been sexually assaulted. The way she was strangled was with a piece of a shoelace that was pulled around her throat. They also noticed that there was an oily substance, like motor oil possibly, dumped all over her body. And the police said oh, that's probably someone trying to hide their tracks, cover their tracks trying to erase any trace of them on her body. The killer also took toilet bowl cleaner and uh, put it all over Arpana's hands and nails, again, to try to destroy evidence. They noticed that the, the linens inside of her, on her bed, had been pulled off of her bed. The comforter from her bed was found uh, in water in the bathtub, so someone had soaked it in water. Despite all these attempts for the killer to erase any trace of them, they did still find DNA evidence that was not Arpana's. The problem though, is that the DNA evidence was from three separate people. The bootlace had skin cell DNA on it. And when they eventually discovered who that DNA belonged to, they were able to confirm that that person did have an alibi for the night of the murder. In terms of how he got, how his DNA was on that bootlace, I'm not 100% sure. He might've known her. Maybe they wore his boots, I'm not sure. There was also trace DNA found on Arpana's neck, like skin cell DNA, and also the duct tape had DNA on it. This DNA matched a man, his name was Emmanuel Fair. Then they also collected a, a robe that had been soaked in Arpana's blood that was thrown into a trash can outside the apartment complex. That robe also had Emmanuel Fair's DNA on it. The third set of DNA matched Arpana's next door neighbor. But this was the neighbor who entered the apartment with the friend of Arpana who then found the body. And so they know he was in the apartment at a certain point when the body was discovered. So it's possible this DNA came from some kind of interaction with that. But the thing his DNA was found on raised some eyebrows because it was the motor, there was a, a bottle of motor oil that had been used, that had been dumped all over Arpana, but his DNA was on that. He also had traces of DNA on that same robe that the other man's DNA was on. When police were looking into this neighbor, they found out that he was trying to delete calls from his phone calls he had made, but it wouldn't have mattered because checking her phone records, they actually found out that Arpana got a phone call. The last call she ever got that she answered was from this neighbor. Whenever he was asked to maybe cooperate with the investigation, he denied it. He was not cooperative. And he always basically said, it wasn't me. I don't know. It's not me. And then eventually he flees to Canada. However, his DNA being found there could be explained by the fact that he had entered the apartment with somebody else. He may have touched the motor oil bottle unwillingly or unknowingly. Why did he call her? No one knows. But what about this other man, Emmanuel Fair? So Emmanuel Fair, because his DNA was found on the duct tape that was on her body, as well as uh, the bloody robe, he was charged with the murder because that was more direct evidence that was tied directly to her body, that the duct tape 
had to have been put on her during the attack. And so that's more conclusive than say DNA being found in the motor oil bottle or DNA being found on a shoelace that many people could have touched. And so he goes on trial, but that trial ends in a hung jury. And so they order a second trial. The second trial happens in 2019, and this time he's acquitted. During the second trial, they were able to flag down that neighbor who also his DNA was present at the scene, and he testified at trial. But here's the kicker. Every question they asked him, he pled the fifth. Pleading the fifth, pleading the fifth, pleading the fifth. They asked him a bunch of questions. He refused to answer any of them. Now, because the evidence of his DNA being at the crime scene on the motor oil bottle, it, it was not considered, like I said earlier, was not considered like concrete evidence of that person being involved directly with the murder. So the they were not allowed to argue that perhaps maybe Emmanuel Fair and the neighbor committed this murder together. They could not do that because the, the, his DNA evidence was not as substantial, it was more circumstantial than it was for Emmanuel. And when he was acquitted, Emmanuel Fair, the jury was questioned and one, of the, one or two of the jury members would end up saying that we could not come to a conclusive, like he's definitely guilty. They said there was a lot of doubt. You have to prove a person's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jury didn't feel they did that because of the fact that they did not, they couldn't be sure if that neighbor had either been involved in the murder or if that neighbor committed the murder solely by himself. Because there was that extra DNA that was present, including that third person who had an alibi, so they knew he, this person, wasn't the killer. But because of that other piece of DNA and that neighbor being really sketchy and fleeing to Canada and not answering questions, not cooperating with police and then pleading the fifth on every question he's asked at trial, the jury's like, we can't say if it was him who did all of this, just him. Or we can't say if maybe he helped Emmanuel. So they had to acquit Emmanuel Fair. Why would Emmanuel Fair's DNA be on the duct tape? There could be other reasons other than committing the murder. And something that the jury did hear was that because this was a Halloween party with multiple different levels, with multiple different apartments, people were in and out of all of these apartments. And that actually included Arpana's apartment at one point. So Emmanuel Affair was there um, that night as well as the neighbor. And so he tried to explain like, I was in her apartment along with about 50 other people throughout this night. You know, people were touching things. People were just sort of conversating and not realizing they were like, you know, they're kind of not touching things or whatever. So it is very possible he could have touched the roll of duct tape in her apartment and that's just how his DNA was on it. And then somebody else committed this murder, like the neighbor. And in terms of his alibi during when the murder would have happened, he said he was asleep in one of the apartments. He didn't live there. That was not where he lived, but he was invited there as a guest and he had passed out. And there were 20 different phone calls made from his phone between like one something in the morning and five something in the morning, including three or four calls to the same person. He says he woke up and he was asleep on his phone. So he must have you know, likely, you know, butt dialed, so to speak, a couple numbers. It's possible. His defense also argued that the evidence found on the robe was in, a, was in a trash dumpster outside the apartments and that dumpster had not been searched for like two or three days after the murder. So his DNA being present on the robe, there there was too much time in between that it could have been easily contaminated by other things thrown into the dumpster on top of it. Cause you know, they're drinking all that stuff and things could have been cross contaminated. And it's it was not exactly the, the most well handled police investigation. It sounds like the evidence collecting wasn't exactly top notch. And Emmanuel Fair was also the only black person at this Halloween party, as far as they could tell. And so they, they also felt there was some prejudice against him being considered the main suspect because of that. So there was just too much doubt with the physical evidence. And so the jury had to acquit him. Plus the fact that the neighbor was considered, in people's minds, considered a viable suspect, but was not really being treated as such. Okay, so I was curious as to why the neighbor hasn't been, wasn't really looked at 
or arrested in any way, shape, or form. So I'm finding it, I, found, I just found an article that stated that apparently he was offered immunity for to testify in that second trial, which is strange because he pled the fifth in all of his questions. So I'm not sure if that immunity deal would have been flipped if he had confessed to doing being a part of it. I'm not sure. That's wild. Why would they offer him immunity? That's crazy. His DNA is at the crime scene, right? He made a phone call to her. Last call she ever took was from him. Why would they offer him immunity? That's insane. Anyway, sorry. It's, it's I was curious. I was like, Ugh. but at any rate, the murder of Arpana Janaga has now remained unsolved. Because Emmanuel Fair was acquitted, he cannot be tried again. There, double jeopardy is in place. So if he did it, then he did it. And he got away with it. I think just given the fact that there were so many people in this apartment building, and there were people in and out of so many different apartments, including Arpana's apartment, and the fact that many people would testify that not only was Emmanuel at one point in her apartment with many other people, it's a very good chance he could have touched things, touched a robe, touched duct tape. And it's, you can't sit there and say for sure that he's the killer when there are possibilities as to why his DNA was on certain things. It doesn't sound like they had like seminal fluid DNA or blood DNA, anything like that. It was really primarily, it seems like touch DNA or hair stuff. And not like, me looking at it kind of from the outside looking in, if I was on that jury, I don't think I could have been like, yeah, guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There's no way I could have. Is it possible he was involved? Sure. But I couldn't sit here and say that he definitively was. That's just, I can't. And you would rather have a guilty person walking free than have an innocent person in prison. Given the fact that, for God's sakes, we just executed Marcellus Williams a few months or so ago. And there was the Robert Robertson case recently where, as of me filming this video, his execution was given a temporary stay just hours before his execution because it's very possible, very likely that he's innocent. And there's a very strong chance that Marcellus Williams was innocent. And so you don't want that. You don't want innocent people in prison. You certainly don't want innocent people being executed. So if Emmanuel Fair did this, that sucks that he's out there, but if he didn't do it, great. It's good that he's not in prison for it. But I don't know, I have no idea. <laughs> but the police there consider her case still open. It's an open investigation. Somebody somewhere out there might have answers and perhaps that someone is you. If you do have any information about this murder, please reach out to the police in Redmond, Washington with any information you have. You can report your tips anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. And so hopefully one day, Arpana Janaga will get the justice she rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case. These cases, true crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. As usual, if you're new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube. Uh, so please subscribe. I would love it if you subscribed. Give the video a like so more people can see it. And I also tell short form kind of slightly longer short form now. Uh, True Crime Stories over on TikTok. My TikTok uh, link is in the, in the description, in the link tree, in the description of this video below. If there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is also listed down in the description. And just send me like the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened, I'll add it to my list. I pick my cases I cover each time at random for the most part. So it'll, it might take me a while to get to that particular case, but I will get to it eventually. But okay, that is it. True Crime Aroonies, we will see you for the next case. Until then, ta-ta for now.